so first of all, I'd like to thank CSR Box for giving us all this opportunity to, uh, you know, put in our points and discuss on a very relevant uh, line of inquiry. And I think we have a very strong panel here and uh, a very relevant topic, access to healthcare. Access, as we all know, I just thought what I would do is just set the context and then open up, um, uh, you know, th this for uh, discussion. Um, access to healthcare is central to the performance of healthcare systems around the world. Uh, as we all know, I think in the pre-pandemic times itself, we had been told by the World Health Organization and the World Bank that half the world's population lacked access to essential healthcare services. We know the solution, it is universal health coverage, but are there any easy solutions here? Because access is a very broad and complex notion. It has several dimensions, geographic access, economic access, social access. And then again, healthcare in India has its own um, you know, share of challenges. It's a very nuanced field. We have lack of um, infrastructure. We have inadequate manpower, urban rural disparities, geographic context again, high out-of-pocket um, you know, expenses, gender-based inequities, uh, which you know kind of creep in. So, and these gaps, they have been highlighted by the pandemic. So all of us know about this, and this is not what we are here to discuss, but rather what we're trying to explore is how have CSR entities been able to influence access to healthcare through pilots that they have engaged in, and how have these pilots led to, or how have what is the kind of potential that these pilots have for some form of uh, systemic change? Therefore, my first line of inquiry would be, what are some of the avenues that uh, the CSR landscape is adopting to enhance access to healthcare? How can these be scaled? Um, I would uh, open up uh, uh, this for discussion now, and I'd like to bring in Atul. I, Atul, I hope you could comment on this, please. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. And uh, I guess uh, it's uh, great to be sharing the dice with uh, so many healthcare professionals. I'm not from a healthcare background. I'll try and contribute in terms of uh, my experience handling healthcare projects. Uh, talking about accessibility of healthcare, uh, India is a country having a population of uh, 138 crore. And uh, as per the World Health Organization the guidelines, uh, the doctor-patient ratio should be around one is to thousand. So from that calculation perspective, uh, India needs approximately around 14 lakh doctors uh, there are different reports in different uh, journals and different forums, but approximately there are close to around 10 to 11 lakh doctors registered on the IMA portal. Uh, however, the question is how many of them are practicing doctors or live doctors in the system who are actually implementing services on the ground? And out of uh, that, how many of them are actually providing services in the rural area? Because when we talk about accessibility of healthcare and uh, the, you know, the most you know, the most critical problem is at uh, the rural level where uh, the healthcare facilities are not accessible. And I would also like to add, you know, not available and not affordable. And, uh, you know, the two other A's that people add is, you know, there's no awareness, there's no accountability. So there's a lot of A's in the system as far as healthcare is concerned. So let's stick to, uh, you know, access for now. And talking about the, you know, doctor shortages out of around, let's say, nine to 10 lakh doctors, which are practicing, there's clearly a minimum shortage of around 5 lakh doctors. Though Niti Ayo, in their recent statement, is talking about, uh, you know, filling up the gap by 2024. Uh, I'm sure, you know, they have, they, there is a plan and uh, there are more than 500 medical colleges producing around uh, 70,000 doctors every year. And there are a lot of doctors passing out of the system because they're retiring, so on and so forth. The problem still remains as far as doctors are concerned. And, uh, there are a lot of pilot programs that we did when I was working for Purimal Swaste, and uh, we were instrumental in, you know, running uh, pilot programs and also full scale up programs in the field of uh, health helpline models, which was to do with uh, just a simple phone call. Now, this this device that we have in our hand is a smartphone. However, you know, uh, there is a mobile penetration in India of around seventy five percent as far as internet users and eighty five percent as far as normal telephone subscribers. India having a population of approximately 138 crore has got 118 crore uh, normal telephone connections, which means that if you take out the duplications, easily over 85% of the Indian population have got access to a simple phone. And from a smartphone perspective, from an internet user perspective, India has got more than 75 crore internet users. Uh, if you take out the duplication, once again, over 50% of India has access to internet, which means that we can leverage the penetration of telecom and use it as an access tool. We can ride on telecom, we can ride on 
the uh, the internet uh, you know penetration and we can provide and this is exactly what we did when we had this uh, health helpline model one can call up and talk to a doctor 24 7 365 days literally the doctor was in their pocket literally because you know they can call up and talk to a doctor a helpline model increases accessibility by having a call made to a doctor or a paramedic who will actually refer them to a doctor in case of need so Oh, you know, they can be incoming calls, they can be ongoing calls. There was another program on pregnancy management under mother and child tracking system, where we had database of, uh, you know, doctors, uh, sorry, of pregnant women. And, uh, you know, we used to do pregnancy management on the phone. It has been noticed and seen that most of the mortality as far as pregnant women is concerned is from the high risk pregnancies. So how about identification, having a triaging done for the high risk pregnancies and have a separate bucket for them. So simple call, couple of questions used to categorize them as a high risk pregnancy, have a separate bucket, have a gynecologist, map it with the local ASHA and the Anganwadi and the uh, you know, uh, uh, AM worker, the local sub-center, and then have a separate intervention program, all done through a simple mobile phone or a simple outgoing call. So what I'm saying is that, you know, talking about accessibility and leveraging technology, I'm not talking about any rocket science. I'm not talking about any you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and robotics and drone technology. I'm just talking about going slightly low on technology, but high on usage, high on application, high on impact. And that is possible through a health helpline model. Uh, the other model that I was uh, working on was a telemedicine model. Now, uh, 25th of March, 2020, you know, is a landmark day uh, because that's the day when so-called legalization of telemedicine uh, took place in India, I wouldn't say thanks to COVID, but because of COVID, the whole process got uh, expedited. And now we have a telemedicine guideline issued by the government specifying the do's and don'ts for doctors as far as telemedicine is concerned. So right you know, from the fact that when can they actually prescribe OTC drugs, when can they prescribe uh, you know, scheduled drugs, everything is specified in the telemedicine guideline. So we had a lot of the pilot programs on telemedicine, a lot of proof of concepts, a lot of experimentation, a lot of learning, a lot of failures for me, a failed project, a failed pilot project that we launched in various districts was well, not exactly a failure. We learned a lot of you know, things from that failed project and incorporated the learnings in the future programs. So for me, a failed program is also a successful program because it teaches you what to do and what not to do in the future. Telemedicine had the initial hiccups, of course, is stabilizing, connectivity is getting better, bandwidth is getting better, and of course, the adoption of technology is also increasing as far as users are concerned. The mobile medical units that we have, uh, that we were operating in various districts, shortage of doctors, not required to have doctors in every mobile medical unit. We can have a mobile medical unit which goes to the doorstep of the, uh, of the person. Talking about accessibility, we used to go to villages which were three kilometers away from the closest public health centers and provide them you know, on, on, uh, on the spot, door care, point of care, diagnostic facilities, and also a referral model to a doctor. Do doctor need not go, you know, and we have the paramedics go, they can do the triaging, they can do a referral, there can be various permutation combination of technology to do with telemedicine, health line, and to be able to increase access. So what I'm saying here is accessibility to healthcare, uh, you know, using technology is possible. It might not be possible for us to increase our doctor coverage overnight. I'm sure you know the government of India and Niti Aayog, they're working in the right direction. However, technology and leveraging technology and riding on the back of technology possibly is the way to go. Pilot programs you know, that we have you know, uh, in tested, experimented, okay? Some of them are successful, no worries. The we'll learnings are the there to be incorporated. Yeah. And then of course, you know, scale up possibilities are there immense. And of course, you know, we need to scale it up. We need to take it uh, to platforms, to such platforms, which uh, can be used to uh, understand the model and have various kind of indicators built into the model to scale it up. And of course, platform like CSR Box is a good platform where we can talk yes. about this, this model and kind of talk about possible scale up in the future. Thanks, Atul. Thanks. So I mean to say, you know, you've talked about one of the game changes here. Technology has been turbocharged, you know, so to speak. I think the pandemic saw all of us leverage on technology in a very big way. Um, I would also want to understand what has been, and you've touched upon it, you know, with the power of models, the power of partnerships. But uh, can I bring in Dr. Kavita to kind of, uh, you know, share her thoughts on uh, what has been the power of, say, innovations, models, uh, you know, in this space of increasing access to healthcare? Yeah. 
Uh, so thank you, CSR Box, and thank you, Anupama, uh, for uh, you know having this and moderating this panel. And uh, Atul has uh, got in some relevant points on a technology, and that is how you know uh, what we saw in the last two years, which really boomed. And it changed the game for a lot of uh, work that we are doing on field. Uh, however, talking about models, um, you know, any program, first of all, that we undertake, we always look at it from a lens of scalability and sustainability. So any model that we are looking at needs to have these two elements. And the best way uh, we feel is to do our work is to work with the government on their project. So you do a pilot and show the proof of the method um, and then the government can take over. So, you know, that's how you can scale it up. So by doing this, you're not only doing your CSR, but also adding greater value by bringing in the expertise, your domain knowledge and resources to the project. Uh, talking about uh, different models, uh, there are different ways in which you can do. So one is work with a partner NGO to bring their expertise and their network to the ground. Uh, second is work with the partner NGO and the government to pool in resources. And third is you can, you know, directly work and bring in your uh, expertise in the organization to work on field. But that becomes a little difficult given your, uh, uh, you know, the time constraints of the other people in the organization. Uh, what one of the models that we looked at was a pilot in Maharashtra. And I'm going to share just two examples over here. And what is it that we looked at it and uh, how, uh, how they are different in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the way we have implemented them. So we did one project called Diabetes with Dignity, uh, which was a community-based intervention uh, with, in Maharashtra in a small village near Pune, uh, where uh, across we did it across two, two primary healthcare centers. And the intervention over here was uh, you know, to have uh, involve uh, ASHA workers, train the ASHA workers, because today, and we are talking about ASHA workers right now, they are overburdened. Yes, there are some 9 lakh ASHA workers across the country, but they have so many other priorities. One of the priorities which was not there was uh, non-communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So we said, if we can train the ASHA worker in having this monthly visit, uh, talking to the patient, caregiver, and having a community-based uh, raising uh, intervention, awareness raising intervention, we could see a difference in the way people manage their diabetes and hypertension and you know the other non-communicable diseases uh, so we uh, at the end of uh, this project the two-year project we did see a change in the knowledge about diabetes the symptoms the management complications and the quality of life actually the challenge over there is uh, people who are daily wage workers are not going to go and seek um, treatment. They are not even going to the nearest PHC uh, where, you know, probably treatment is available. So how do you mobilize these people? So we worked on this model of ASHA workers and showed it to the government. In fact, it was recently published in one of the journals, this um, uh, data and uh, the government. So we have already given it to the government to see how it can be scaled up by using ASHA workers and leveraging the ASHA network. Uh, the second pro project that we did is um, again in the state of uh, uh, Goa and uh, you know when we were in discussions over there with the health minister and we were discussing what is it that we can what value can we bring to the table and what can we do for the communities uh, we realized that uh, a uh, there was a rising rate of obesity in Goa in the schools in children so it was very imperative very important that to be uh, talk to the children now so that they become healthier adults tomorrow and that the burden on the exchequer comes down. Uh, so we launched our global program called KIDS, which is Kids and Diabetes in Schools, and it aims at bringing a behavior change. So we're sure you are not only talking to the children, but also to the family members and to the communities. So this is the third year of the program. So we have reached out to 150,000 children. We have trained some 1,700 odd teachers. We have reached out to 450 secondary schools. Now, how do you, what is the model? So we said that we will work with the government, we'll work with the education department. So we work very closely with the education department over here and ensuring that all the content that we have created is put on the education department portal. Now, once it's on the portal, it is accessible to all the teachers, all the children, the students, the parents. So then it becomes sustainable. Uh, of course, there is a lot of handholding. You know, you cannot just develop it and give it to them and say that, okay, fine, uh, we have uh, done the training of the trainer and finish. No, while we have completed three years, we realize this is not going to be enough. So maybe we need to work for another year or two more till the time the government actually takes it up. It may not become a part of the curriculum, but 
um, it can become part of one of the activities and that is how that is where we are working towards so giving them the proof of how it works what are the impacts uh, what are the uh, indicators which are actually showing an impact and we have seen a lot of those so i think uh, these I think that's fun. great, Kavita. You know, yeah. So what you've yeah. done is you've actually piloted, showed them that it can work on ground, yes. and yes. so then there is a potential for uh, you know it to be scaled up, and uh, that's a, that's a systemic design, you know. So you've addressed, but then would it be geographic, uh, you know, specific? That is another thing uh, we would have to consider. Would you know would it be able to pan out? You know, but several lessons there, Kavita. Thank you so much, and um, I think we'll move on to Sujay now. Sujay, if you'd like to uh, pitch in and you know tell us about your experiences uh, and what you you know coming from a tech background, it would be helpful to understand you know your how you've leveraged on technology, no doubt. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, uh, thank you, CSR Box, for the opportunity uh, to be part of this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, just to give some quick in insights about our work, uh, especially uh, in the last few years and uh, especially in the last uh, during the pandemic. What we have seen is that, uh, you know, as uh, uh, Mr. Atul was mentioning about the huge demand and the supply gap with regards to the medical forces and the patients, we have also understood that uh, at any given point in time, it is impractical to really think that you will have doctors in each and every village, even for the next 50 or 100 years. The only way that it is possible that with the emergence of the technology, like with my background in the technology, one of the major challenges which we have really seen is that India as a country has tried to adopt a top-down model, meaning that whatever models are there in US or Europe, we are trying to adopt in an Indian context. But India as a country is very different in many ways, uh, wherein every 50 or 100 meters, if you go, you'll see there is a different dialect, there is a different uh, other challenges are there. And even from the health specifics also, different regions has different dynamics with regards to health also. One of the uh, important things that we have done is the usage of the frontline health workers to go up to the last mile, especially during the pandemic when our frontline health workers were able to go to the patient's doorstep. And uh, well, most of the focus has been on the COVID patients or the pandemic patients, the major problems with the patients suffering from diabetes, hypertension, cardiac ailments, pregnant mothers were completely left out. So through our technology and model, for example, our frontline health workers were able to do something like fetal Doppler for the pregnant mothers at the doorstep, which has been unimagined for. Imagine a pregnant mother during these COVID times were where she would go for doing this crucial examination. So in this case, we have been able to bring such devices, simple hemoglobin checkup, which is very, very essential for every trimester that has been missing. So we have been able to bring such devices to the patient's doorstep to do that test. So Jay, the frontline healthcare workers were of what qualification level, if I may ask? They were like a &M levels? Yeah, so they are of a &M levels. And what we have done is we have uh, selected them, we have trained them and usage of the technology. One of the other important factors which we have also seen is that the data, for example, in the CSR, when you are sitting on top of the CSR panels and you really want to figure it out that, okay, in this current uh, new fiscal year, which are the areas wherein I need to focus on, which are the gaps, which are the loopholes? What one of the important things that we have really done is the data, uh, you know, a complete uh, seamless capturing, meaning that when a patient is being monitored or checked, even across, even in a rural area or an offline, whenever the vitals are being checked up, the data is captured onto the platform. And when the health worker is coming within the internet zone, this data gets seamlessly, uh, you know, uh, transferred to the doctors. Not only that, for any kind of disease, be it the hemoglobin, hypertension, and many other devices, we have done complete data capturing, which does seamlessly. So on, a, uh, on a, any, any kind of report generation level, for example, when we roll out the telehealth for the entire state of Nagaland with different partners, wherein we have figured it out that the major problems for any doctor or any, uh, I would say, decision makers within, let's say, the CSR fraternity, for them, the major problems are that they are not uh, in charge of the accurate data that is actually happening on the ground. So if you are able to capture the data seamlessly wherein with minimal human interaction, with minimal human intervention, the quality of the data can be increased manifold. And we all know that India as a country is coming up with the NDHM or the National Digital Health Mission, wherein we'll be really focusing on the digital health ID for every citizen of our country in the next several years. The quality of the data, the data that is captured on the ground is also equally important for you to take any decisions. When I was a speaker at a WHO conference in Geneva, World Health Organization, even WHO really does not know that 
how and in which way they are going to plan for the next year or the next couple of years wherein as a csf fraternity if they are able to uh, really uh, plan and uh, you know design the interventions in a way wherein let's say during the pandemic we have seen that none of the state governments or none of the health ministers were knowing how many patients are uh, really suffering from diabetic how many are hypertensive how many of them have cardiac ailments so without such kind of data how do you uh, can really fight a battle so that that is where i think we need to really emphasize on the quality of the data the data that is captured on the ground the quality of your frontline health workers what kind of activities that they are doing on a day in and day out basis how we can really improvise on the performance these are the things that we really need to think uh, for us to plan and optimize in a better way thanks sujay so i hear you what you are saying is data points you know having large scale data points which are you know which are being captured live data and something uh, you know where human error does not creep in and also the power of partnerships like what you've talked about yes. in nagaland and of course one thing which we all seem to agree on is the power of technology so saying that i think i'll go on to neha now and uh, you know i'd like to uh, neha to opine on what are her thoughts on how can we kind of you know uh, you know what are the kind of models avenues the innovations that we can bring in to improve access um see i think uh, you know government i mean i i absolutely agree with all the points made by my co panelists here uh, i think that government and private sector does a very good job of reaching a certain a uh, certain percentage of the population uh, but there is a certain percentage which is the gap and that's really where csr and civil society ka has to come in and figuring out what those gaps are in health access uh, is you know like the first step towards building any kind of sustainable program uh, and i think you know one of the biggest things that when we talk about access that we may be missing is looking mm -hmm. at equity in health access is there how much is the health equity when it comes to say tribal populations you know 7% of the country's population lives in tribal areas but these are some of the most remote most difficult to reach areas there is never going to be a doctor there there has never been a doctor there and so uh, bringing access to a place like this actually comes uh, through in our experience with a combination of various factors yes uh, my co panelist touched upon telemedicine that is one so if doctors can't physically be there let's talk about how we can make them virtually available uh, but there's also other ways to do it like task shifting uh, you know where there again even if you have a remote do pool of doctors there's still not going to be enough to meet the healthcare needs uh, and you have frontline health workers who are able to provide more culturally appropriate and sensitive care to communities um and so task shifting within the ambit of regulation of course and through appropriate digital tools uh, that enable quality task shifting uh, can be another way to improve access training of course of healthcare workers i think a lot of training started being done online and you started seeing all of these great e learning models come up in education but then also in healthcare to uh, and all of that also goes towards improving access so we feel like a combination of telemedicine task shifting uh, training can be a really great uh, tool to you know enable uh, health access especially for the most underserved um another lens that we look at when we think about access is gender equity um so a study we did in rural gujarat showed that women spend 1.5 times more than men to access healthcare and that's not just because of social constructs so yes of course uh, women are 88% of women travel with a companion when they have to access a healthcare service as opposed to 40% of men who travel with a companion most men have the agency to travel alone uh, that increases the cost for a woman to get access but then also um, cost of medicines for women's health issues is more expensive than for uh, generic health issues cost to do a consultation with a gynecologist is more expensive than doing with a general practitioner so when you compound all of that there is this enormous tax that gender has uh, you know that women have to pay when accessing healthcare and all of that makes them less likely and you uh, know our study uh, which will be published soon you know similar work came out of all india institute of medical sciences uh, that looked at this and so you know technology and it's 
not meaning to say that the pandemic created these problems they existed from before but if there is one silver lining to look at it helped us accelerate the pandemic did accelerate adoption of digital healthcare delivery models and we found that in the same communities in gujarat where we implemented telemedicine uh, in along with you know the eason jeevni program uh, of the government you were able to we were able to bring about gender parity in healthcare uh, access when uh, you know it's equally accessible to people of all uh, socio economic uh, uh, backgrounds equally accessible to people of all genders so it's a very uh, interesting construct uh, that you have to look at when looking at health access another interesting construct is looking at um, social stigma around mental health around sexual reproductive health issues and how things like health helplines can actually help uh, bridge those um, those uh, stigma and gaps so that's another kind of uh, approach that we've done i think maybe a little bit of a uh, this might be controversial but our approach has always been to be open source with technology so you know i don't sharing... think it's controversial it would be the way we would want to envisage uh, all technology right yeah true but how many open source uh, telemedicine technology platforms are there out there like how many globally there is a big shift towards digital public goods and global goods yes. but uh, how much of ai are we actually open sourcing how much of that are we locking away into proprietary barriers uh, open source gives a lot of power when you are building out tools like during the pandemic we had over 200 plus software developers from all of the big tech companies pitch into the code base uh, that's not something you could do with a with a kind of a, a not not something that's not a public good so uh, i mean the reason i say controversial is because when i talk about open source in many forums uh, and especially forums with government there's always this sense of i intellectual property and fig figuring out you know and especially even with hard with hardware so it's a it's an interesting thing what we can do with and i'm not saying open source is the only solution but it's a very interesting model to be able to uh, improve health access uh, and so our goal has always been we don't set up our own telemedicine networks we actually work with partner organizations that want to add a digital mode of healthcare delivery to their existing in person programs during covid that became a necessity but the trend we are seeing is even post you know over long term digital modes of healthcare delivery allow you to have a multi channel approach to reach the same uh, person and that Thanks. allows you to yeah. look at access in very different ways um and so the the important thing again like i, I guess you know which is going off of my co panelists here partnerships are so important uh, we all work in a very connected ecosystem and uh, it, whether it's an ngo a local a hyper local ngo working on the ground or whether it's a government working you know work, figuring out how we can come together as a platform and you know work together has always been a great way to to scale and and grow thanks a lot neha so i hear you and uh, you know you've made some real important points so you've talked about thank you for bringing out the point on gender equity you know it's so important that we factor this in in our programs and also about task shifting i think this was also mentioned uh, by one of the participants here posed this question in the q and a and also of course you know technology is a public good you know so that's that's so very critical for us to kind of understand and uh, just to be cognizant of time i thought we'll go on to our next round and uh, i request uh, all of you to give us uh, you know two salient points what you think are about challenges basically i'll pose a question uh, shortly and then we'll open it up for q and a i see a few questions there in the q and a box but i would request the participants if there is any other query please keep posting and we'll take it up at the end um, all the panelists have agreed that we should keep at least a good 8 to 10 minutes for q and a uh so saying this i'll just go on to uh, you know the next line of inquiry what we were looking at is we've all talked about successes of our pilots no doubt of course you know we've all faced uh, you know certain obstacles but that is a learning in itself so what have been the challenges in scaling up a pilot project what are the you know the challenges could have been in terms of the policy structures in terms of the mandates in terms of the collaborations how have you made partnerships work and so basically what we're trying to understand is what has actually worked on ground what have you kind of encountered and what has worked on ground so uh, let, let, let's start with you atul if you can kind of you know talk about your experience yeah uh, interesting question uh, challenges as far as scaling up is concerned now uh, before i go to challenges as far as scaling up is concerned let me also discuss challenges in terms of implementation and also implementation of pilot programs implementation of proof of concepts now uh on the 23rd of uh, 22nd of jan i think uh 
20, uh, there was a CSR rule. CSR yes. manual, yeah. yeah. So uh, section 135, uh, schedule seven had a CSR rule amended. Uh, and in that rule came in a new legislation or a new kind of uh, requirement for all the NGO partners, uh, you know, to have certain uh, criteria to be able to work at the ground level. Now, as you know, we uh, corporates, we are so dependent on uh, NGOs as far as uh, work at the ground is concerned, work at the bottom of the pyramid is concerned. Now, even to implement a pilot program or a proof of concept, we require the help of NGOs. Now, uh, let's say, you know, we have an NGO. Uh, now let's talk about, uh, you know, West Bengal and uh, I'm based in Calcutta, Imami's head office is in Calcutta. Unfortunately, last two years uh, in Bengal has been very challenging in 2000 uh, and uh, 20 came the Amphan cyclone and uh, the Sundarban area was completely devastated. Okay. And as we were recovering from Amphan came the Yash cyclone and the Yash cyclone had a dual kind of a disaster, two disasters, you know, happening at the same time, which is the COVID was anywhere there. And then, of course, the, you know, the cyclone was there. So we thought of working very much in the Conti area and in the, you know, cyclone pronged, you know, kind of affected area, which is the Mandarbani Diga area of, uh, you know, South Bengal. Now, uh, we have certain NGOs who are great in terms of their community connect, their, you know, their penetration level, their, you know, reach out is very good. They have a good presence at the ground level. They've got good stakeholder relationship going. However, they do not have a CSR registration number. They do not have an ATG, uh, ATG income tax uh, registration. They do not have the 12-way exemption. They don't have, let's say, three years of experience. Some of them are new NGOs. So that limited us in terms of working in those areas to be able to provide the basics. We're talking about, when we talk about a cyclone affected area, please understand, we don't talk about anything which is a health or uh, you know, education. We're talking about basics, roti, kapra, and makan. Because, you know, I had been to some areas and then, you know, I still remember a man standing in the middle of the field with just one piece of cloth, a gamcha, and he had nothing. His whole house was blown away in the cyclone. There was no house. There was no home. There was no clothes. There was no utensils. There was nothing with him. So what do we do with him? We put him in a shelter home. We give him food. We give him, you know, water. We give him medicine. We look into, you know, kind of making a house for him in the future. We look into livelihood. So from that perspective, it is not possible for us to work at the grassroots level. NGOs have to work. And this is where, you know, we have challenges in terms of working with NGOs and, get, um, uh, and getting even the proof of concepts implemented or the pilot programs implemented. Also, uh, to do with uh, the size of the program, let's say we are working in Sundarban area. Let's say we are working in uh, you know East Midnapur area. Now, according to me, uh, there has to be a sizable uh, size of a pilot program for it to be factoring all areas or indicators of a program. You can divide this into the fixed and the variables. So to scale up a program, I think what is required is demonstrable results. We need to have good evidence and proof of a model working in a, you know, uh, in a particular geography. Because sometimes, you know, one size fits all policy doesn't work all the time. If I have been working, let's say, in South Bengal, in Sundarban area, and I think Dr. Sujay Santra has also worked in the Sundarban area very extensively. He knows about the problems. He knows about the accessibility issues. He knows about the mindset, the culture, the socioeconomic condition. So scaling up a Sundarban project, for example, you know, will not be possible in any other area because it is geography specific. So we had faced some geography specific challenges in terms of scaling up. And as far as scaling up is concerned, we all talk about, you know, uh, the government, you know, is the best uh, partner to scale up. Scale is only possible through the government and they are the only kind of the partners with whom we can make a transformational effect as far as the entire country is concerned. However, you know, the government model also has certain challenges in terms of sometimes the government treating, you know, the partners as a vendors and not partner and there's not equal relationship. There's a big brother approach. So these are some challenges of scale up that we all face. And so the uh, the idea that we are now exploring is a PPP, which is a private-private partnership. So we have a PPP, which is a public-private partnership. Of course, it has challenges, it has limitations, it has a lot of areas of improvement in terms of relationship. A private-private partnership is also one solution. I'm not saying it's a perfect solution because here we're talking about fellow corporates. Some of them are competitors, some of them are, you know, kind of uh, having the same, um, you know, objective, the profit motive, accountability to shareholder value versus stakeholder value. So these are some of the challenges that we face. I think PPP is the way we are trying out. We are in touch with a lot of private organizations. See if the CSR pool can be collected. See if uh, we can leverage on the collective power of our competencies, our skills. 
our knowledge, our governance, you know, mechanisms and see if we can solve a problem. Too many pilots, too many, you know, it's like, you know, we have, you know, pockets of, uh, you know, uh, islands of excellence in a sea of problem. Pilots are kind of, you know, there in the all working in isolation. It's time to have a comprehensive approach and to be able to make a transformational change as far as any landscape or geography is concerned. We need to be working together either with the government or with the uh, or with the uh, uh, like the, uh, the private partners and to be able to work at scale we need to kind of you know factor a lot of these variables okay in a pilot program work on the variables economies of scale doesn't always work okay so from that perspective we need to identify factor for this and make sure that we identify our partners and then of course i'm a strong advocate of platforms for scaling we need to you know to take a program to the policy makers to the government we need to you know use appropriate platform just presentation of a case study on a seminar like this might not suffice we need to have you know bigger platforms to scale up uh, to uh, present the demonstrated results of that pilot program thanks a lot Atul. so you know from what you've said uh, i understand you know you've uh, kind of rightly commented on the power of uh, private private partnerships like you know as opposed to say public private what you're saying is both can work you know and we need to leverage on uh, various kind of models in order to take the agenda forward and you're very right most of us seem to be stuck in pilots and it doesn't seem to scale so forming consortiums of like minded corporates such as us and i think csr box is a great forum wherein you know we get to understand uh, you know what are the thought processes of various organizations so this is a great starting point and uh, glad to know that you already have such uh, you know kind of partnerships uh, happening i'd like to hear from kavita uh, you know what do you feel are some of the set of challenges you faced yeah uh, so i uh, clearly resonate what atul just mentioned uh, on ground challenges with the ngos having a certification so so that is one challenge and at the government level and we do a lot of work at that level and uh, we have had our learnings and uh, our insights from there uh, but the major things what i have seen is as uh, so there are many many challenges on ground but uh, at the government level definitely there is changing of officials at the government level all the time so you go and present your uh, you know project to one person who has signed off the other person and it happens like what four times in a year so yeah. you have to keep on going on reiterating go up and going and making your case and ensuring that you get the buy in so that is one big challenge again high attrition level of the healthcare personnel at the ground level um so that again you train somebody and they are gone you know so th then uh, you know it is a setback and uh, it, your project gets delayed because of that Uh, so what uh, i feel and from my experience is that we have to be aware of this right from the beginning and you need to have a plan b uh, and the process it could be government or it could be non government uh, the process is something that any csr manager should know like the back of the hand i think and it's very important to be prepared in anticipation so what i have i do now is i list down 10 things that can go wrong and then you know you are prepared so i think uh, Uh, that is how i mitigate those um for example and there is also something which is very important like you are working with the government uh, and i'll give you one example which really put me off guard and uh, i could not take off my project well until the third quarter uh, so we work on a jan december year uh, and uh, whenever we are working on projects and whether it is with the ngo or with the ngo working with the government or we working with the government whatever it is we ensure that we are part we are aligning it to the pip of the government so whenever they are doing the pip we ensure that you know it is a pool of resources that we are collecting and on one such uh, pro project which is a big project um, the pip the approval came only in the end of the second quarter so by the time we could take off it was third quarter and then you know everything was derailed so these are some challenges again uh, who has the decision making power Uh, who are we talking to are we talking to the person at the top or are we talking to the person who is implementing because the person who is implementing clearly is an implementer will tell you tell them what to do they will do uh, but the decision is not there again you know if there are some other uh, priorities which come in in between then your project goes for a toss so i think these are the challenges that we face all the time but now we have learned we know how to mitigate them we know how to be prepared for it more than mitigating we know how to be prepared for it so there has to be a constant dialogue a constant interaction over there at the ground level then at the level of the government uh, which then you know can keep your project uh, online i think uh, that happens all the time thanks kavita sujay would you want to comment here please yeah with regards to the challenge one of the major things that we have really seen that 
when you are doing a pilot and you really want to scale, let's say the CSR has some corpus of money and then they are putting it for the first year, second year. But if the project is uh, or the CSR priorities change uh, changes, then automatically you have to wind up that pilot. And uh, the beneficiaries are the most affected in such cases. So what we really feel is that we have, let's say, the sustainable model wherein uh, through our frontline health workers, what we have designed is that uh, these frontline health workers are able to earn a uh, livelihood because they are charging the patients and that's how even if the priorities of the CSR changes after a few years, the project is self-sustainable in nature and that is definitely benefiting to the community. Uh, so one of the aspects in terms of the scale definitely is the fund or the, uh, the priority of the funds uh, if those things can be materialized and if the CSR funders are able to look at a long-term perspective, meaning that nothing no, no change you would be able to do it in a in a short span of time maybe a year or two years if you really want a, a deeper intervention if you are able to think on a sustainable platform over a long haul period of at least three four five years then you would be able to see a real major impact uh, over that uh, time so that is i think one of the major things which we all need to think about thanks a lot sujay so uh, just to keep uh, you know track of the time i'd like to neha to kind of answer and then we can go on to you know q a because there seem to be quite a few questions, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, pilots have to be designed in the pilot stage itself with scale in mind. So very recently we put out a, um, can, a, a canvas, a program design canvas that talks about the 15 key things that we should keep in mind in your project when you're starting in the pilot phase itself. And when you put it into the design of it from day one itself, you know, you are doing it in a systematic manner, which in, improves your likelihood of, of scale. Uh, another important lens that a big challenge that we have seen uh, is community trust. Uh, especially during COVID, especially around all of this messaging that has gone around. Uh, and, you know, so many... Um, uh, so many challenges that you face around that it's it's not just only about you know like the, the funder or the the implementer the challenges uh, of community reception and adoption are probably one of some of the biggest ones that might cause a pilot not to be very successful because you started it you know just because you build it they will not come <laughs> you have to make a lot of effort to uh, improve acceptability of what you're doing, especially since awareness, as uh, uh, Atul mentioned, is, is, a, is a big problem in, in, uh, in um, many areas. And this is not just for uh, rural populations, also for urban populations where you want to work on improving health access in urban areas, which is also, you know, uh, not uh, uh, can have uh, certain gaps. So, you know, keeping, I mean, I guess the only, and we have, we have failed at a lot of pilots. It's been, you know, it, it, you should dare to try, of course, when you, when you figure out, you know, you want to try on some new use case. Uh, like we, we looked at uh, doing a pilot, which was, uh, uh, which was quite, uh, you know, had a good success in terms of outcomes where we looked at improving malnutrition, so outcomes for severe malnutrition using uh, telemedicine, especially in the context of the COVID pandemic when Anganwadis were shut and malnutrition treatment centers were inaccessible for many people. Um, but then the challenge of you know, post the outcome success in the pilot was how are we going to fund this? Where's the policy advocacy that allows for malnutrition treatment to be delivered digitally instead of in person care? So those policy levers are some of the biggest ones to hit. Uh, and so if you can build out, say, a good RCTs or high quality impact evaluations into your pilots, those can create a lot of data and evidence for scale. So I hear you, Neha, you know, some of the points which you've talked about are scale by design, which, uh, you know, you've looked at and you've kind of incorporated that the challenges of community trust and also the issues of policy levers. And Kavita, just to come back to you, you've talked about how, uh, you know, uh, it's been difficult, you know, dealing with the smaller NGOs because of the CSR amendments. And also about, you know, some of the practical issues which we all face, such as government officials being transferred, the high attrition level of uh, healthcare workers. And I think that's a great point, what you said. I'm going to do it, list the 10 things down. I used to list five things, but I'm going to make it 10, which can actually go wrong, you know, makes sense. And uh, Sujay, I think that's a great point, you know, building in sustainability into your model. So I hope I've been able to kind of, you know, uh, cover all the points, you know, various points, great points which have been made today. So we'll go on to, um, I mean, with the permission of the panel, is it okay if we take up a few questions from the Q&A box? Some have been addressed to various panelists, but um, I think everybody yeah. can kind of chip in. And uh, I think one of uh, 
the points which has been asked repeatedly is about task shifting and uh, but i believe that that's been addressed a lot of us here have tried pilots in which we have looked at alternate uh, people you know come in and uh, take up tasks um so there's pankaj tiwari from jan swasthya sahayog and he has asked a kavita a question what would be your take on the relevance of community mobilization models without stressing on the availability of treatment facility at nearby government hospitals kavita would you like to take that yes. uh, also the others yeah yes uh, so we are working on these uh, models on but not definitely not without having treatment availability at the government centers huh? so the whole point is um, see we can't be there for the rest of our lives it's because india is such a big country the needs are so many you can't be there all the time you need to build it uh, make a pilot and hand it over to the government and that is what you know corporates are what to do to bring in our resources our experiences our expertise to show them how it can be done yeah. now the government is funding the government is supposed to fund for the medicines and that is has to be there so when we are doing pilots or we are having community mobilization programs we ensure that the nearest center the government center has the facility has the infrastructure and then you mobilize people so you know you say that without stressing that you know the medicines are not available there it won't work because whatever pro projects you do will be for 3 years 5 years what happens after that if you leave the project it has to be sustainable then it has to be at the government level you have to ensure that the medicines are available and we have worked on such projects where we have said that the phc has to have that infrastructure and when you go and show do the rapid formative assessment do the baseline do the gap assessment show it to the government they put it in place i think it's about that so anything without uh, the government intervention we should not even attempt because it not, it will not be sustainable thanks uh, so there's a question by atul batnagar sujay seems to be typing an answer but uh, also you know he wanted to ask about task shifting and how can paramedics you know be involved in um, you know rather than as frontline healthcare workers so um, neha i think uh, even atul as well as sujay you know sujay if you'd like to pitch in here yeah uh, with regards to the role of the paramedics and the anms definitely i think both are equally important because let's say if the anms are doing the first level of the screening and wherever there are requirements for advanced services wherein the paramedics can come in let's say the phlebotomy is to capture the drug, blood and other things so they are also equally important as part of the whole value chain within the healthcare delivery so you cannot undermine any specific role so both the roles are equally important to deliver effective healthcare all right thanks so uh, the thing is there is another question by uh, mr vinay venu who says that many of the solutions i see described here are technology enabled but it looks like the real solution described was task shifting of some task from a doctor to a person or a computer um so i we you know we all agree yes there was some form of task shifting but technology has played a you know great role so for example he mentions teleconsultation with a triage person to identify high risk pregnancies in the form of a task shifting enabled by, through technology so atul you had mentioned something about high risk pregnancies correct yeah and uh, about triaging happening through through technology would you want to comment here have we actually looked at only technology or has there been some form of task shifting which has happened here also i think it's a very uh, simple process i mean like uh, here here uh, let me let me talk about you know technology you know from a perspective of uh, you know user acceptance okay and uh, here the technology is limited to just a couple of questions uh, you know being asked to the pregnant woman the answers being captured in an algorithm uh, and of course a clinical decision support system and of course the on the basis of the questions the algorithm throws you know the outcome in terms of whether a person or flags the pregnancy as a, a you know uh, as a high risk medium risk low risk and all that so you know technology is kind of you know replacing kind of uh, you know everything and uh, you know we don't have to have a lot of human intervention we need not have kind of a specific person who is trained you know technology just a capturing of a couple of responses and as per the response you can have the intervention plan you can have the connection plan you can have you know the bucketing done so from that perspective i think technology is very robust technology is available technology is flexible technology will be able to kind of you know solve most of the problems and even even today if you look at you know a lot of uh, you know technology based solutions right right now which is ai based solutions a doctor who goes through so much of education so much of knowledge so much of years of hard work you know after all you know he inside his mind you know kind of does a lot of diagnosis 
and i was talking to a doctor and uh, he was talking about you know the main problem is the diagnosis the main problem is identification of a problem once you identify a problem the solution becomes easier so for example the diagnosis is the main thing and this algorithm and this various permutation combination various kind of questions helps you in terms of coming to a diagnosis and the diagnosis you know once done helps you you know to have a treatment pattern so i think technology is the way to go uh and uh, you know we are talking about uh, you know doctors yes we will we will not replace doctors however you know all that you know you know the thinking the thought process that goes inside the doctor's mind can be taken over by the system by the computer by the application software and, and of course we can throw a lot of results already you know if you type you know on google and just say symptoms you can type your symptoms and the you know simple browser google based application throws you what's the problem that you have and on the basis of problem you can do the medication so once again technology is what you know we would like to focus on as the way future in the absence of doctors but i just like to add here you know what happens is like for example in terms of high risk pregnancy the doctor you would wait for the doctor to diagnose but in this case what is happening is you have given an app perhaps to the staff nurse there so in that sense she gets empowered to take a decision because she knows that there is a robust technology helping here i think we've had this experience i mean in my previous role at narayana health also the icus owing to the technology and the iot and all that which was available there the staff nurses icu staff nurses needn't have to wait you know for certain emergency decisions because you know there was a lot of cdss or clinical decision support system which was built in so they were empowered to take certain decisions when they saw for example electrolyte levels changing or that sort so yes while technology has a big role the task do shift you know the kind of they, they empower certain uh, you know groups of uh, care providers to take you know a very kind of um, uh, a careful decision here i mean that's what uh, that's what my experience has been here like you know um so there's another question neha for you since you brought in the gender equity part of it um, there is uh, binita moitra i saw her here she had asked a question about your experience in uh, you know how how have you kind of addressed uh, gender equity archita moitra sorry yeah she wanted to hear about your experience rolling out um, you know the the gender equitable lens in health yeah so it it starts of again by being very intentional in the program design is is by understanding and recognize i think we all understand and we all recognize there is gender inequity in health uh in health access uh the important thing is to understand the social constructs that are causing that gender inequity and then figuring out ways to improve it so couple of examples i'd give of projects are a project we are doing with uh, ibis reproductive health we are supporting ibis reproductive health and vikalp sansthan in rajasthan uh, it's a health helpline for sexual reproductive health services as well as for women survivors of domestic violence where they can call in helplines they can receive a uh, healthcare services if they are having physical health issues mental health issues but then also legal uh, services and support that they need uh, as as uh, survivors of domestic violence uh, with uh, uninhibited we are supporting a menstrual health helpline to allow um, adolescent girls and adult menstruators to understand uh, safe practices around menstrual health and hygiene these are taboo topics not very openly talked about so when you are able to you know speak you know confidential uh, even uh, in in a safe manner with uh, with a counselor about you know what what are the right steps you could take so these are some ways in which you look at you know what are the social constructs that hold women back from accessing healthcare equitably and then you work out designs and solutions that overcome those social constructs um, another important challenge of course is smartphone ownership and phone access for women so while there may be a phone in the house it's usually with the male earning member of the family or uh, usually the son or the uh the husband or and the woman access to that phone may be limited so when you are designing a health helpline project what especially one catering to women you have to be mindful that many places you will have to add a component of say a local asha worker who can be the health access point for women who women can come to her and she can facilitate a call for them so it's very important to think about all of these things when you're when you're looking at gen a gender lens to program design all right i think uh, that there are thanks a lot neha you know what you have mentioned is that you know you looked at it by design and i think that's amazing 
Uh, there are several questions which we may not be able to answer. Dr. Braj, I know that you have posted a question and I would request Kavita also to look at it. And uh, there are certain questions, please look at your QA boxes panelists and uh, whichever, whoever can, please do answer that. But uh, we're, we're short of time. I think we've kind of absolutely ended it um, at uh, 1655. I see Sparsh has put on her video, which is a signal to us to kind of now kind of leave the, uh, the floor. But yeah, Sparsh. Another five minutes, ma'am, if you want. Yeah. Have so uh, I would like to take that question of Dr. Braj. Yeah. Uh, and he's asked a question on India holds 28% of the global burden of tuberculosis. Yes. And the CSR investment to TB is minuscule and how to address this. And the question specifically to me is, will Sanofi be interested to do a pilot with rifapentin as chemoprophylactic therapy for children under three years, under six years? Uh, so uh, clearly one A, this is not in the scope of CSR, you know, to do um, such a pilot or to do such a, a project. Uh, second, uh, we do not have, uh, so it comes under clinical trials. And second, uh, we uh, also do not have marketing rights yet for Rifapentin. So we will definitely not be able to do such a, a pilot. Kavita, I think there was another question from you. I see it's disappeared, but I think it was about whether the uh, the educational um, you know initiative which you had yes, was I it geography that. agnostic. I you answered that. I, I think it is in the answer, but I will read it out for those who want. Yeah. So there was a question. I can't see the answer. That's the reason yeah, I was asking. It is in the answered one, but I can read it over here. Uh, so the question was, the interventions with school ecosystem on health is geographical agonistic or is it limited to your manufacturing units? Information on your geographical presence will be helpful. And I have answered to that saying that um, the program is available for all. Um, it is free. A lot of resources which can be used by teachers, parents, and children, and I've also given the resource link where you know it can be accessed. So anybody can use this program. Great. Um, and last but not the least, and especially you know keeping the CSR amendments in mind, are all of us uh, corporates ready to support pilots for a duration of three to five years, or NGOs who are doing you know good pilots for three to five years? I now, think I'll what that. is what yeah. is your take on that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, it's open to everybody. I think I think I'll answer that. Please. Yeah, yes. because you know, uh, like with the uh, with the recent amendments coming up, okay, and as long as the NGO is identified or as per the due diligence, they have been cleared to do CSR, then of course it will not be a problem for the uh, corporates to keep on funding. Now, the duration of the funding will depend on the scope and the length of the project. And there is no such problem. So I think, you know, from an impact perspective, it is very right that impact measurement is not possible in a year or two. It will take three, four, five years. And uh, as long as the, uh, you know, capacity building of the NGOs, like we are, you know, ourselves doing a lot of capacity building. We are doing facilitating of the NGOs. We are also helping them, you know, set up the governance system, the system processes, enablement of technology and everything, and try and work with them long-term and identify them as partners because they are implementing projects for us, which is for the corporates. And of course, they are going to, you know, kind of work hand in hand with the corporates to be able to show the results for the corporates. It's like, you know, it's not as if, you know, we are funding. The difference between donation and CSR it's is a partnership. Donation is yeah, it's the not partnership. A, it's not the transfer, the money is not taking yeah. place. We are actually working with them and they are, you know, kind of helping us, you know, help, uh, you know, reach our objective and our collective vision. So I think Thanks. that should not be a problem. Yeah. Thanks, Atul. Kavita, Neha, Sujay, any thoughts here? No, I NGOs. think. Uh, yeah. Go on, Sujay. Yeah, so uh, I would say it would depend on the intervention to intervention. Let's say in some of the cases, you might need a short term to figure it out what really works. And then once you have been able to prove, then you can design for a long term one. Kavita? No, so I uh, am with Atul and Sujay both. I think A, now the mandate is that you have to have programs which are long term. So I think that question should not now bother the no, five years. See, sometimes programs yeah. go on for five to six years, but especially education, one plus three, you yes. know, the one year and then the three years of, you know, uh, ongoing project definition. Can we go beyond that, you know? If you yeah, want so to make a long term, yeah. Because so, otherwise, there are programs you cannot make an impact in three years and four years. Absolutely. Great. So Thanks. It has to, it has to extend. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right, then. I think, uh, you know, we've been able to answer quite a bit in the QA box. So, Sparsh, uh, over to you. And I'd like to thank all the panelists, Kavita, Neha, Atul, Sujay. There were some excellent points which were made. I have learned and I hope the participants uh, got to, you know, understand and at least learn from your insights from the field. Amazing, uh, amazing job. Thank you so much.
Спасибо.